want you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. And um, Matthew chapter 7. And I'm going to pray. And to those who uh, I see you here, Andrea and Jasmine, I'm sorry. We, we're going to get back to you this week, all right, about the, the setting up that meeting for the choir. Father, we thank you for this time. And as always, Lord, we just ask that you would just uh, continue to bless us with your presence. Lord, help me to communicate truth to your people. Lord, as I say every week without apologies, Lord, your word is that incorruptible seed. And that seed has power. That seed has the power to produce. And what it wants to produce in us is righteousness. That is right way of thinking so that we can live right. So I pray, Lord, help me to scatter the seed. But as I scatter the seed, Lord, let every heart here be open now to receive what you would say to us today. So we commit our hearts and our minds to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And let us all say amen. Thank you, brothers. Appreciate you. So we've been in a series for the last two weeks called Thy Word. Everyone say Thy Word. Everybody say thy word. I need to hear from you guys. You slept later than the 930, sir. So yes, thy word. And we're focusing now on the word of God. And so week one, we looked at the canon of scripture, meaning how uh, the canon, that is the closure of the Old Testament took place, closure of the New Testament took place. So we kind of got into the fact that the enemy has, since the beginning, has always tried to snuff out the word of God, has always tried to get us to question the word of God. Like even in the garden, remember when it was there that they were contemplating, you know, the different trees in the garden and the enemy said, did God really say that you couldn't do this? What was he doing? He was attacking the word of God. So the enemy from the beginning has always, Monica could see you, has always been attacking the Word of God. And so as time has gone on, you know, we understood how the Old Testament came about. We talked about that. We talked about the New Testament, how it came about. But even when it came about, there were men in the church who were trying to snuff out the Word, the enemy using them, so that the common man could not understand the Word of God by reading the Word of God. Because how I many you know once you get this Word in you, it changes you? The scripture says we're transformed by how? The renewing of our mind. And so new information leads to transformation. At least that's the way it should be. And I'm repeating this because I want you to remember that what we need to do is take in the word of God. If you want to be changed, you're not going to be changed by osmosis. You're changed through the word of God. Somebody please say amen. amen. All right. Are we all alive today? Yes? All right. You're the 1130 service. You slept in. I want to hear more from you than I did from the 930. Yes. And so with that being said, we talked about this, uh, thy word still stands, that no matter what the enemy has tried to do, guess what? The word of God still stands. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord endures what? Forever and ever and ever. And then last week, we looked at the fact that thy word is spiritual food. Because we compose of body, soul, and spirit. Some believe spirit and soul are synonymous, and that's fine. But we understand that we're a body. So when you see someone, right, when you see Pastor Adrian, you say, that's Pastor Adrian because you know what he looks like. So his body identifies him. You can, in this crowd, we're all spirit beings, you know, and our bodies house our spirits. But we identify one another through our bodies. And so the same way the body is identifiable, guess what the body needs? It needs food. It needs food in order to sustain itself. So we eat certain foods to make sure the nutrients get to where they go. So we like that fried chicken. No, we don't. We don't like fried chicken. We like baked chicken. We like that mac and cheese. No, we don't. We like zucchini. Uh, we, like <clears throat> we like that creamy, that creamy spinach. Somebody say amen, right? It has to be creamy. But we take these different things and we eat them to feed our body so that this way we can get what we need to be sustained in life. But the same thing happens with our souls. Our soul is what? Our mind, our emotions, and our will. Because the mind and emotions is what determines our will, our decision making. And so what is that? You know, taste, touch, see, hear, feel. But it's what we see. It's what we read. That's what feeds our souls. So we feed our souls either junk or not junk, right? Because what, what they say, garbage in, garbage out, right? So that determines how we make our decisions. But remember this, that in the beginning, God created man out of the dirt of the ground. And it says this, that when he formed him, he breathed into him, what? The breath of life. And then he became a living soul or a living person. So it took God's breath breathing in him in order for that clay, that dirt, to become, al to come be to become alive. And so we understand that the, the way that we get our spirits fed is how? By the breath of God. Well, the scripture says that all scripture is what? God breathe. And so in order to feed your spirit, what you need to do is you need to read, digest, chew, meditate on what? The word of God. It's not enough just to feed your body. It's not enough just to feed your soul. What we want is for our spirits to be connected with God. Because in the beginning, remember when they sinned against God, they were banished from the presence of God. And when they were banished from the presence of God, it broke intimacy with God. But even in the beginning, God so loved the world that he didn't send his son at that moment, but he did sacrifice so that he can have communion with them. 
Because remember, in the garden, when they sinned, they tried to clothe themselves with fig leaves. But the Lord said, what are you doing? What are you, like, really, what are you doing? I, pr- I promise you that's what he said. Like, really, what are you doing? But then what happens is this. The scripture says that he clothed them with animal skin. And in order for there to be animal skin clothing them, an animal had to what? Die. So even then, the first sacrifice took place. God always intended to be with his people, and he would do whatever it takes to fellowship with his people. I don't know about you, but that makes me happy today. Can we put our hands together and thank God that he always goes after us? It's not us going after him. It's him coming after us, always wanting to commune with us. But the moment we sin, now we spiritually die. Yes, physical death will take place, but there's spiritual death that took place. And so our spirits are dead. And this is why we need the Holy Spirit, because his spirit makes our spirit, what? Alive. And so the word of God is what the Holy Spirit uses in us to help us to be what? God conscious. Because we don't want to just walk around just being world conscious. We want to be God conscious in everything that we say and do. And we get that from how? From what? The word of God. Are you all with me? Give me a head nod if you are. Yes. So we need to be fed. We feed our spirits the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by what? The word of God. So last week I talked about application because that's very important. Application is very important because you can know a thing, but until you practice a thing, how many know you still don't know a thing? Right? It takes experience to really uh, grasp what it is that you need. And so I told you about a book by Howard Hendricks that I hope by now you've purchased because I mentioned it seven days ago. And Amazon Prime delivers overnight. And if you have Kindle, it comes immediately. I'm just saying, living by the book, it's only like $9. That's one caramel macchiato, four shots. I'm just saying, I'm, I'm still throwing it out there. Living by the book by Howard Hendricks, right? And in there, I told you that that's where he really breaks down on how to study the Bible. Because when we approach the Bible, we have to approach it in three ways. We have to approach it with inter- observation, interpretation, and application. So what is observation? Observation is when you read the Word of God, what does it say? I'm sorry, what do you see? When you first read it, what do you see? What's happening there, right? And that's what observation is. So we, we pray over it repeatedly. We, uh, we read it repeatedly. We meditate. We chew on it. That's what meditation is. Repeatedly. So that's observation. The second thing is what? Interpretation. Interpretation is what does it, what does it mean? All right? So as you read it in the context in which it's written, the culture, the setting in which the, the writer wrote it, what does it mean? What exactly is he trying to communicate? Because remember, context, remember, a text outside of his context is what? A pretext, and a pretext is something that's just not true. It's not false. It's not something you should base your life off of, okay? So we want everything in its proper context. So that's what interpretation is. But then we have application, right? And application is what does it mean to me? So how do I apply this? Because how many know you can read this thing? When I say this thing, I don't mean to be irreverent in any way, okay? Don't take it that way. But you can read this book, and guess what? It has no effect on you if you do not apply it. It's just like, you know, the doctor tells you to take this and apply it to your wound. Well, don't be mad if it... If, if it doesn't heal in the time in which he said it would heal if you apply it to the wound. Because if you don't apply it to the wound, then it's going to take longer or it may not heal at all. Right? right? So application is everything. And as Howard Hendricks said, which really blew my mind in terms of just really caused me to reflect. I look at myself. He says, don't just look at the context. Don't just look at the text in terms of like um, know what it means. But know, you got to know yourself. Don't just know the text, but know yourself. Because then you'll know how to apply the text to yourself. Are you all with me? Just say amen if you are. All right, so remember, what is it? Observation, interpretation, application. Say it with me. Observation, interpretation, application. One more time. Observation, interpretation, application. That's how you read the word of God. So again, thy word, is, thy word still stands. Thy word, word is uh, spiritual food. And today we want to talk about the fact that thy word sustains me. Thy word sustains me. Jesus Um, preached the greatest sermon ever. We say Jesus preached the greatest sermon ever because we believe Jesus was the greatest preacher ever. And of course, he would be the greatest preacher ever because as he's preaching the word, it's the word who's preaching his own word. And so who best to deliver the word than the one who wrote the word? Somebody say amen, right? And so he preaches this sermon called the Sermon on the... You're a good class. This side. Now you guys are on it. I don't know what's up with that side now, but this side, you guys are good. Yes, the Sermon on the Mount is the sermon that we're talking about. And it composed of chapters 5 through 7 in the Gospel of Matthew. It's also in Luke chapter 6. But 5 through 7 in the Gospel of Matthew is the Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus' greatest sermon that we know of and most lengthiest sermon that we know of. And here's what it says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. 
It says this, now when Jesus saw the crowds, don't worry, we're going to still go to Matthew 7, but hang in there. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to what? Teach them and he said. So notice now, there's crowds around, right? But now his disciples come to him. His disciples are those who are followers of Jesus, but not just followers of Jesus, but those who sit at the feet of Jesus those who desire to hear what Jesus says and to obey what it is that he says. A disciple is a pupil. It's a student. That's what a disciple is. And so the, there's followers and then there's disciples. There's crowds and then there's the, the inner circle, if you will. So the crowds are there, but he's teaching, speaking to his disciples, but he's speaking in a way that the crowds can hear because he wants the crowds to hear what it is that he has to say as he's teaching his disciples. And he has some things to say. And when Jesus now does this Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is now radical. I mean, Jesus has some things to say. Jesus would say, you you have read, it says X, Y, and Z, but now I say A, B, C, D. So this is what was, but this is what is. I mean, yo, you got to be somebody in high authority to say that, no, things have changed. And that's what Jesus is doing when he's teaching this Sermon on the Mount. And it's there in the Sermon on the Mount that he gives what I call a 20-point sermon. How I many know that's a long sermon, right? They're taught in the art and science of, t- of preaching. How I many news? They t- basically let you know, hey, what you should do is three points and a conclusion. And if you can, three points, conclusion, and a rhyme to end the sermon is what they say. But three points. Imagine if I got up here and said, guys, I got 20 points for you today. By the fourth point, some of you be like, peace, I get, I'll catch you next week, right? But 20-point sermon, and it, that's at least what I found. Maybe there's more in there, but at least 20 points he's making in this Sermon on the Mount. And let's just hear some of the things he's saying. He talks about, obviously, the Beatitudes, and the Beatitudes, this Sermon on the Mount, starting with the Beatitudes, really deals with the heart. It's not so much about what you do. It's about what it is that you feel on the inside. It's about your heart, because your heart really determines what it is that you do. So he deals with the heart and the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who are humble. He talks about all those different things in the Beatitudes, right? And that just talks about an attitude, a change of mind, right? So when he says Beatitudes, many preachers or teachers would tell you, you should say, this should be your attitude when you read the Beatitudes. This should be your attitude. But he not only talks about the Beatitudes, but then he goes into salt and light and that how we're called to preserve and also add flavor to the world in which God has placed us in, right? So instead of cursing the darkness and cursing the world, how many know we're called to be salt and light in the world? Because where there's darkness, light is needed. Many of us, when that song was being sung, we got excited about it. They shine your light through the darkness because you're in a dark place and you need light to get out. Well, guess what? People are in a dark place in this world and God uses you and me as many lights to get them out of the place that they're in. How many know if, we, if this place was darkened and like, you could not see your way, we would take out our cell phones in a heartbeat, right? And that little light will be, give us enough light just to get out of the dark place that we're in. Well, that's what you're called to do, and that's what I'm called to do. Be salt and light. Salt preserves, right? Not only does salt preserve, but salt gives you an appetite. This is why I know you've never been to a bar, but this is why at bars they put peanuts there, salted peanuts and cashews. And, why are you looking at me like that? Maybe I went there before I learned the new Jesus. Maybe I went after I knew Jesus because I was going with somebody. <laughs> the point is, salt is meant to give you an appetite, right? Make you thirsty, right? Make you thirsty. And so with that being said, this is what we're called to be, salt and light. He also talks about that he's the fulfillment of the law. He talks about murder. And he says murder is not just something you do. It's something you think because, again, it's in your heart. You may not have committed the thing, but if it's in your heart to do, then guess what? You've committed murder, Jesus would say. He talks about lust and adultery, and many people say, oh, I can't believe he did that. But Jesus says, don't think about just what they did. What about what you thought? Because if you thought about it, then guess what? You've committed it as well. So don't look down on someone who has done it because you yourself may be thinking it, and it's equal in the sight of the Lord. See how it got quieter here? Holy hush. Can you imagine the crowd's like, what? What is he talking about? So you mean I'm just like them? Yep. Yep. He also goes on to say, talks about divorce. Now, this is important because a lot of times, especially today, you know, of course, Jesus gives the two reasons. He talks about infidelity, and he talks about, of course, if someone dies, that's the second thing. But then the third thing is abandonment. And many people look at that as if someone just walks away, just leaves. But it's not just if someone walks away and just leaves, but the context there in the culture, is, the context is also one Paul would write about in 1 Corinthians 7, about someone who abandons their God-given responsibilities as a husband or as a wife. So there's abandonment there because the covenant has been broken. They're not under 
what it is that Christ would say. Remember, uh, the wife is called to be under the husband, the husband is called to be under Christ. But if the husband is not acting in accordance to Christ and he has abandoned his responsibilities or she has responded her responsibilities, then that is also a type of abandonment. Now, don't look at it like, well, he don't pray with me. Now he's abandoning me. Stop. That's not what we're talking about. It's deeper than that, but that is what we're talking about here. So it's very important because a lot of times people keep people in weights and keeping them in situations that it's just not healthy for them. Now, I'm not talking about if you leave the seat up and now you want to leave him because he doesn't put the seat down. That's not what I'm talking about, okay? We're not looking for reasons to leave. Thank you for the one amen over here. Can I get another amen over here, okay? I knew this morning was much better. They just went along, right? But that's, we got to make sure we're keeping it in the proper. So that's divorce. But then he also talks about oaths and he talks about revenge. You know, we were taught an eye for an eye. Jesus said, no, 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 there's no eye for an eye. As a matter of fact, Paul would write and say, listen, and I think it's also Proverbs. If, you know what you do? Here's how you heap hot coals of your enemy. Do good for them. Right? So it talks about revenge. He also talks about this. Love your enemies. We're taught, no, hate your enemies. He says, no, no, I know you've been taught to hate your enemies, but I'm telling you to love your enemies. See, again, this is radical teaching because many of us, if you're, we're just so uncomfortable right now. Like, I got to love those haters? Yeah. Yep. You mean I got to love those enemies? Yep. Because the scripture says we were once enemies of God. <laughs> But while we were yet enemies of God, yet he still loved us, right? Amen. He also talks about this as I'm going through these 20 points real quick. He also talks about this, fasting, right? And when you fast, he says, make sure you don't do this. Don't sit there and be like, oh, I'm fasting. I'm so weak today because I'm calling on God. <laughs> you know, don't you do that because many, many people would do that. They would walk around like they're fast because they want people to know that, you know, they're so pious. They're, they're, so, they're so close to God. I'm just, look at me. I'm dirty. I haven't washed. I haven't eaten. I haven't done anything because I'm just drawing close to Jesus, drawing close to God. He says, no, no, when you do that, don't let anybody know you're fasting, but do fast. He says, when you fast, which means do fast. Tell us about the importance of prayer. When you pray, why? Because it's important to pray. As a matter of fact, he gives us a model prayer of how we ought to pray. He also talks about trusting in uh, your treasures in heaven. He talks about don't worry. Right? Don't worry. It's a sin to worry. He talks about also, you know, judging others. In other words, don't judge others because as you're judging others, guess what? You, you've heard it said in, in, in elementary school, when you point one finger, you got three fingers pointed back at you. Y'all never heard that? Now you know. When you point one finger, you got three fingers pointed back at you. And the truth of the matter is we judge people based on what they do when we ourselves do other things that maybe they don't do. Right? And so be careful with judgment. He says, with the same measure you judge, you'll also be judged. And that would help a lot of us to stop judging people. When we realize the same measure, think about that, the same measure. So how deep you take someone's, whatever they do, and you, oh, I can't believe them, you look at them. And the Lord is saying, now I got to look at you that way. That's why with me, I'm like, I don't see nothing. <laughs> I don't see a thing. <laughs> Anyway, moving right along. He talks about ask, seek, and knock. He talks about the narrow gate and the wide gate, right? So there's a wide gate and narrow gate. Narrow gate leads to life. The wide gate leads to destruction. He talks about that. He also talks about true and false prophets. He talks about those people. Paul would write about those who just say things to tickle your itching ears, to make you just want to flock to them. But then he also talks about this, true and false disciples. He says there would be many who would say on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we preach in your name. Lord, Lord, didn't we perform miracles in your name? Lord, Lord, didn't we lead people? Didn't we go to the train station and tell people about you? Lord, Lord, didn't I tell people to go to Matthew chapter 7? Lord, Lord, didn't we see the miraculous done? He would say, depart from me, for I never knew you. I never knew you. Not that I didn't know about you, and not that you didn't know about me, but we never knew each other. In other words, we didn't have an intimate relationship. You didn't walk with me. You talked about me, but you didn't walk with me. Can you imagine? That's very sobering. I don't know about you, but that's very sobering to think on that day after doing so much. At least you feel like you've done so much and, you, and all these different things, but then the Lord would say, depart from me, for I never knew you. And it's not, no, Lord, you, you mean so-and-so, right? No, he's talking, I'm talking about you. We never had an intimate relationship. You never trusted in me. You trusted in your own works. You trusted by doing that I was putting you in right standing with me. No, 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 no. I used what you did so others would know who I am. But you, I never knew. That's a very uplifting message right there, isn't it? Now we're in Matthew 7. Because after all of that, right, it says this in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Because we just finished chapter uh, verse 23. So let me read verse 23. It says, then I would tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil do. verse 24. Therefore, everybody look at me for a second. And remember, whenever you see therefore, you have to go back to see what it's there for. 
Well, I just did all that with that 20-point sermon there that Jesus gave, right? So now he says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundations on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as the teachers of the law. Look at me. Look what Jesus is saying here. Here we have two people hearing the same thing, both building the same thing, both building a house, and that house was representative of our lives, both building a house, and both using the same material to build the house. However, both are not building their house on the same foundation. Verse 27 says this about the, that house. He says, when the rains and floods came and the winds beat against that house. Everybody say, that house. Because he's looking at it. This is a parable. Now, remember, a parable is a story to illustrate a truth. And so we're learning a truth from this story that Jesus is giving. So that house. There were two houses, but he's talking about the one house whose house was built on the sand. He says, that house, when the rains came and winds beat against it, it will collapse with a mighty crash. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. It will crash. And whose house is that? That's the house of the hearer only. Those who hear the word of God, but those who don't practice the word of God. So right now, as I'm speaking, right, there are hearers and doers in this congregation right now. Hearers and doers who are watching online. Hearers and doers who will be watching for days to come, or months and years to come. Hearers and doers in every congregation, everywhere where the word of God is being preached, there are two types of people. You can call them the wise and the foolish or the hearers and the doers. But definitely people are hearing. And isn't it something they both heard the same thing? Think about it. They're both doing the same thing. They're both building. They're not lazy people. These are people actually doing something. They're both building. They're, they have uh, God-given dreams or some just have a dream, but they're working towards a goal. And they're using the same material that they're hearing. It's the same material that they're using to build. Yet, one collapse and the other one stands. Let's be clear. The reason for that is because of what? The foundation. Now, when you look at the houses from the outside, you may say, yo, those houses, those are identical houses. You know, look, they look beautiful. Look how nice it is. 9,000, 10,000 square feet. Look how many bedrooms, seven bedrooms, five bathrooms, a uh, nice pool, Olympic-sized pool, tennis courts, basketball courts, you know, white picket fence. I mean, it got, and a dog. I mean, yo, that's a nice house. It reminds me of believers. For the most part, there are sometimes you see people you know they're going through, you know, they wear their hearts on their sleeves, as they say. But then the most part, for many people, you say hello to them, hey, how you doing? Praise God. Oh, I'm blessed and highly favored. How are you? And meanwhile, that looks good on the outside, but we know, uh-uh, uh-uh. Because when the storms come and the winds blow, that house is not standing. Are you all with me? Just say amen if you're with me. Because why? Because one is building on sand, and sand means self. That's what sand, when you think about sand, think about self. Because they're building it on their own ideology, their own ideals, their own ideas and ideals, and their own uh, way of thinking. They're not thinking and doing it the way that God would have them to do it. The Bible says this, that the fool says in his or her, her heart that there is no God. That's Psalm 14.1. The fool says that there's no God. And what does that mean? Basically what they're saying is, I don't need anyone to guide me. I don't need one to speak into my life. I don't need any being, any deity to guide me along life's journey. I can do this myself. And that's what the sand represents. Sand represents just self. That's what the sand represents. And many believers live that way. Where we say we trust in Jesus and we trust Jesus for salvation. And let me tell you something. If you never do anything except say yes to the Lord and you believe that he died on the cross for your sins and that he took your place and that he was dead, buried, and raised to life and is now at the right hand of the Father. Listen, if you believe that, you are going to heaven. I promise you. There's nothing else you got to do. There's nothing else you got to do. So you're not, you don't get in by the skin of your teeth. You don't just make it, Whoo! I got it. No, you in. But while you're here on earth, there are things that God wants to do in you, through you, and for you. And that's where we mess up. That's where we miss out when we want to build on the sand instead of building on the rock. 
So while many people say I'm doing well, everything's fine, we know things are not well. You know when we find out? We find out when the rubber meets the road, when the storms come. They always say about a tea bag, right? You know what's in the bag when it's hot, when it's brewing. You know what's inside of a person. And that's what happens with even believers. He said the wise man builds his house, his life on the rock, the rock, the rock. Because this, here's what kept coming over and over. And I wanted to make sure I, I didn't forget this. Here's what we kept reading. The rains came, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. I'm going to say it again. The rains came, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. And the thing is, it beat against both houses. It beat against the house that was on the rock. And it beat against the house that was on sand. So both houses got beat bad. And when it says beat, it's talking about violent. It's not like a little soft, like, ooh, how cute the waves came on the shore. No, this is like ready to sweep your house away type waves. And it's coming hard. And let me tell you, it's coming not just for the house that's on sand, but it's coming for the house that's on the foundation. The difference, though, is what is your house built on? And what it should remind you and me of is this, that guess what? We're not exempt from the storms. Now, I want to tell you, I tell you this all the time. I, I wish I could come up here and say I decree and I declare that everything in your life is going to go well. In Jesus' name, I would be a liar. I would be that false prophet that Jesus is finished speaking about. Because everything in your life is not going to go perfect. It will work out for your good. But while you're going through it and while it's happening, it won't feel good. There will be some hurt involved. But he promises, like my friend Pastor Ryan Faison said, he he says, you know, the Lord says that, uh, you know, um, I I promise you a hope in a future. I have plans for you, says the Lord, plans to give you hope in a future, plans not to harm you. But he didn't say it wouldn't hurt you. And I mean, no, it hurts sometimes. So what does that mean? That means for the believer, you got to understand, don't think just because you serve Christ that life circumstances won't hit you because it's called life. There are people who serve Jesus, guess what, that never, ever get married, although they want to get married. There are people who serve Jesus faithfully, and guess what happens? Sometimes because they can't control the other person, the spouse leaves. There are people who serve Jesus who lose their jobs. There are people who serve Jesus... Guess what? They get cancer. People who serve Jesus that lose loved ones. People who serve Jesus that have children that are strung out on drugs. There are people who serve Jesus that, you know what, sometimes they battle with depression from time to time. Things happen. Life happens. Storms come. But remember, one storm, one house was able to withstand the storm while the other one collapsed. People who serve Jesus, oftentimes, sometimes, guess what they have? Miscarriages. These things happen. And so what happens is this. It's foolish. It's very foolish for anybody to say, well, when you serve the Lord, don't worry about anything. Because the Lord promises that he'll be a shield about you and nothing will happen to you. Oh, yeah? How did that work out for Jesus? He's the son of the living God. Yet the son of the living God was tortured, beaten, bruised. Hung, naked, put to shame. And you'll say, but Tyrone, that was the will of God. That's my point. It's the will of God. God allows things to happen to fulfill his purpose because our lives are about bringing him glory. I know this stuff is not popular, brothers and sisters. But I, I, when I stand before God, the scripture says, I got to give an account for my ministry. It's either going to be like wood and hay, or it's going to be like, you know, the, the, like gold. And guess what? I will be, be able to withstand the fire that he's going to test it with. So while I love all of you, I'm more concerned about when I stand before him. He's going to ask me, did you rightly divide the word of truth? Did you give them this, this blank check, or did you warn them, and did you remind them that they belong to me? Now, when you go through, I promise to be in the fire with you. Now, when the waters come, I promise that they won't, it won't be so much that you will drown. I promise to be with you. But I didn't say it wouldn't happen to you. He talks about one house on sand, self. The other house is on the rock. Look, look what it says here. Uh, Proverbs chapter 10, verse 25. The writer of Proverbs, the book of wisdom says, when the storms of life, when the storms of life, when the storms of life, when this, come on now, come on class, help me out. When the storms of life, when the storms of life, you know what that means? I can't, it's coming. 
I can't promise you those other things, but I can promise you this, the storm is coming. And you know what they say about storms, right? You've heard it a billion times, heard it a billion and one. Either you're going into a storm, you're in a storm, or you're coming out of a storm. Either way, it's going to be a storm. He says, when the storms of life come, the wicked are whirled away. Because we, what he's saying is that the wicked and the righteous are both going to experience this storm that's coming. But the godly have what? A lasting foundation. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul writes this. He says, by the grace of God, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder. I love that because remember, Scripture interprets Scripture. So again, we, when we look at certain phrases and things, you look back to see where else you can find it in Scripture. And obviously, Paul, you know, walked, I should say Luke rolled with Paul for a season. Luke investigated. That's how he got the gospel of Luke. And in Luke 6, he mentions about the wise builder. So this is where Paul is probably mentioning, I laid the foundation as a what? Wise builder. And someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is who, everyone? Which is Christ Jesus. Which is Jesus Christ. In other words, brothers and sisters, listen, the reason why we're able to withstand what comes out, whatever may come our way, the storms, is because you ready for this? You ready for this? We're built different. And you need to know that today. Or you need to know that you're not that today. One or the other. Here's what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 4. He says this. He says, we are. Now, let's just stop right there. He is a believer. I mean, do we get a stronger Christian than the Apostle Paul? I don't think we get a stronger Christian than the Apostle Paul. I don't care how long you've been walking with the Lord. I don't care you came out of your mother's womb speaking in tongues. I am tell you something. You ain't stronger than the Apostle Paul. Okay? And yet, this is what he says. We are hard-pressed on every side. In other words, there's no side that's exempt. Every side, every side, right? But not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Can we put our hands together and thank the Lord for just that right there? For that right there. Because notice... You will be hard-pressed. You will be perplexed. You will be persecuted. You will be struck down, but take heart. You won't be crushed. You won't be in despair. You won't be abandoned, and you will not be destroyed. See, focus on the promise of God. There's a process, but remember the promise. So you got to go through the process in order to get to the promise. So there will be problems that are attributed to the process to get to the promise. We rejoice over the promise, but you forget there's no promise without a process. You got to go through, brothers and sisters. And it's, listen, it's painful. It hurts. But he promises to get you to the other side. But so the question is today, because remember, same teaching, hearing the same thing, same materials, building the same building the house with the same materials. But what is your house? So let's go back now. The house is what? Your life. My life. What is, what is, what is your life built on? How do you make your decisions? How do you rule and lead? How do you lead your life? Is it based on human wisdom, meaning your own, or the latest guru, the latest life coach, the latest this and that? And I know I mention those people a lot. I'm not against them. I'm all for anyone that God can use. He used the donkey. He can use anybody. He uses me. God, come on. He can use anybody, right? But what I'm saying is don't get caught up with those who have words in the moment and forget the eternal word, which is the word of God. So what is your life built on? Musicians, if you get ready to come, who are you following? Who are you listening to? When you make decisions regarding your family, is it based on what you saw someone else do with their family? Or is it based on what the Word of God says to you? How many are with me? Just say amen if you're still there with me, right? Because notice now, here's the, here's the key word. Let's go to Matthew 7 again, verse 24, as we close now. And I want everyone to read this nice slide with me. He says, come on. Come on, say it with me. Therefore... Everyone who hears these words of mine, stop. Which words? His words. And not just when you read the Bible, look for, you know, if you have one of your Bibles like I have, look for the letters in, in red. No, don't just look for those. Remember, he is the word. Remember what he said? You hear me say it all the time. Those men on the road of Emmaus, it says that he opened the scriptures and from started with Moses, the prophets, and the law. He began to show them how he was on every page, basically, talks, how it talks about him. Remember what he told the Pharisees, you search the scriptures looking for eternal life, but you don't realize that the scriptures speak about me? 
So from Genesis through Revelation, brothers and sisters, that's his words. So these words of mine. Now, in the context of that day, he was talking about the Sermon on the Mount. So that, I want to make sure I'm careful about that. But I promise you, if you take what he said from the Sermon on the Mount and you apply it, then you know what? You will be a wise man or a wise woman. But notice now, here's the key. Takes these, who hears these words of mine, because everybody hears the words, but that's not the key. What's the key? The next part. And puts them into practice is like, there's the metaphor, there's the simile, is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. So who's the wise person? The person who comes to church, hears the word of God, claps because they heard something that tickled their ear or something that really encouraged them for the moment. Someone who stands because the song really moved them. Maybe it was the organ, maybe it was the drum. Is it that person? Is it the person who sings in the choir? Is it someone who works the cameras? Is it someone who even preaches the word of God? Is that the person who's the wise man? Nope. The wise person is the one who's not a hearer of the word, and the wise person is not the one who's a teacher of the word. The wise wise person is the one who practices the word, who takes that word and applies it, practices day in and day out. You look at any great um, person who does whatever they do, great artist, music, composer, songwriter, Michael Jordan, um, Tiger Woods, we look at them, we go, man, they're gifted. Exactly, they are gifted. And sometimes they say, you know, they were just born naturally gifted, born natural leaders. Yeah, you may be born naturally something, but guess what? There's always a tweak involved. And this is why they have coaches. This is why they have mentors, people who can see their blind spots and say, hey, here's what you need to do, and here's how you need to do it. This is why many people, and I always encourage, go to counseling. Get, get somebody to see things from an aerial point of view. Because when you're in the maze, if you've ever been in a corn maze, it's hard. Like, you, you go in here, you go in there, you get, ah, you get frustrated. Like, somebody help! So it's always good to have someone who has an aerial view who can just say, ah, you need to go to the right. Okay, keep going. Go to the left. That's what you need, right? Because they, they help us. They help perfect us. We never get perfect, but they help perfect us. We, we all need that, brothers and sisters, right? So that's what practice is all about. When you keep doing it, you get better at it. When you keep applying it, guess what? You get better at dealing with things. This is why whenever you go to anyone, whether it's a counselor, if you come to a church, if you don't get any application, run. Don't go back to that person. You're wasting your money. You're wasting your time. Application is everything. I don't just need to hear a good thing. I need to know how do I do the thing. Because guess what? If you have a weapon in your hand and don't know how to use it, it is very dangerous. You can hurt yourself. And this is what has happened with so many people with the Word of God. They take that Word and they use it and don't know how to use it, and they have hurt themselves, self-inflicted wounds because they just don't know the word, or they're sitting under someone who doesn't know the word, who just quotes it but don't understand it. He says, when you put it into practice, I think about this. Um, there was this guy, right? <laughs> Years ago, this became a famous uh, little, before there was memes and all that, this was a famous little clip, and uh, he, he didn't like to practice. Matter of fact, he was getting in trouble because they were saying, you know, hey, what happened, so-and-so, you didn't want to practice? He goes, Practice? Man, we talking about practice? Like, this became famous. Like, practice? We talking about practice here. Like, like he's basically saying, like, well, I got to practice, man. Y'all getting on me because I didn't practice? Yeah, but guess what? All those people who practice, guess what? They got championships. You don't. You know why? Because he didn't want to practice. And many believers are losing in the game called life because they don't want to apply. They don't want to practice. I've been there. There were some games I should have won. Some scenario situations where, you know what, Tyrone, this is an easy one, man. This is a ground ball because the Word of God says, so just do what it says. And you know what, this will, this will happen. But nah, nah, I think I can do it better. Anybody else been there? I think I can do it better. I think I can do it better, God. That's why the Scripture says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end leads to death. It seems right, smells right, looks right, feels right. Everything about it is right, but if it's not God, it's wrong. And everything pertaining to your life and my life, guess what is found in the Word of God? You want to know about finances? It's found in the Word of God. You want to know how to be a better spouse? It's found in the Word of God. How to conduct yourself as a a person who belongs to the Lord? It's in the Word of God. How to make decisions? It's in the Word of God. Now, it won't tell you who to marry, but it'll tell you what kind of person you should marry. That's for sure. It won't tell you he'll be six something, you know, whatever, whatever you're looking for, or she'll be five something, whatever, whatever you're looking for. But it would tell you, watch her character, watch his character, watch his mouth, because out out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Who are his friends? Because birds of a feather flock together. That's not the Bible, but that's a good one, though. (laughs) 
Let me make you biblical. Walk with the wise, you become wise, a companion of fools, suffers harm. Let me, let me bring it back to the word of God. All right, but yeah, so it will tell you those things. What to look out for, again, because what do you want? You want when life happens, troubles, struggles, disappointments, you don't want to collapse. That's, that's not the will of God for you. You want to be able to take a lick in and keep on ticking, right? You want to be able to just, you want to win. I want to, you want to win in your, your marriage. You want to win with your, being a parent. You want to win at being a good employer, a good employee. You want to win at your health. You want to win at all these different things. That doesn't mean things are going to be perfect, but you want to win. It means you want to keep going on. I love, I love when guys who are older, like in their late 30s and early 40s, whatever, who are in different sports, I love when they get championships. You know why I love when they get championship rings? Because you know what? They were still there. I mean, those young cats, they tried to come in and take their spot, but they couldn't. You know why? Because they were just good at what they did. There's that one kick, I don't know his name, but my man's like 40-something years old. He's still kicking. Nobody going to take his spot because they keep doing what it is that they do. Are you all with me? Just say amen if you are. Here's the last thing. Truly is my last thing, I promise you. Here's what it says. Hebrews chapter 1. The sun, everybody know the sun is Jesus, right? The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Remember what it says in Colossians that he is the image of the invisible God. So as I often remind you, if you want to know who God the Father is, then you find that in the person of Christ Jesus. Read the scriptures. Understand the heart of God by understanding who Jesus is, right? So he is the exact representation of his being, and here's the thing, sustaining all things by his powerful word. His spoken word, of course, his creative word, but notice all things are being sustained by his word. Do you realize the sun is being upheld by the power of his word? When he said, let there be, it was and it still is. The earth is where it is and being upheld by the power of his word. The moon is being upheld and the gravitational pull of the earth, even though other things, when it gets into the earth's atmosphere, it comes coming right in, boom. Guess what? The, the, the moon, as big as it is, it stays right where it is because by his word, he keeps it where it is. By his word, guess what? Things came forth. By his word, he says, out of the, the, the waters, let living creatures come. Out of the ground, let vegetation come. By his word, everything that we see is being upheld by his word. And the thing is, if he just withdrew his word at one moment, then everything would collapse. But nothing's collapsing, brothers and sisters. I'm not talking about what man is doing around the world and how evil things are. I don't even, I'm not even talking about climate, uh, climate control and climate weather and all that. Uh, warming, what do you call that thing? Change climate, right? I ain't talking about all that. God still got everything under, his, under control. How do we know he still has the whole world in his hands? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. By his word, though. Listen to me now. I know I've been yelling the whole time. I'm going to yell a little bit more. By his word, everything is being sustained. So if he's upholding the universe, because one translator said, if he's upholding everything by his word, you're telling me he can't uphold your life? You're telling me he can't sustain your life? I'm sorry, you're just not as big as those other things, okay? But you're more important than those other things. And he will sustain you by his word. So yes, I want you, I desire, as your pastor, your brother, your friend, I desire, feed on the word of God. Feed your spirit so you have a God conscious. I want that. I hope you want that for me too, right? This is for, you know, this is for all of us, yo. Sorry, I got Brooklyn on you. This is for all of us. I really am sorry about that. But this is for all of us. Seriously, this is for all of us. But as the shepherd, because I love you, I desire this for you. It breaks my heart when I hear people going through and they're just ready to give up and give in and say, oh, I don't do this anymore. And I ask them, so what's it like reading? And it's not about works. It's just that you need to feed, you need to feed yourself. Because I know if you just build your life and if I build my life on the foundation of God's word, the truth of God's word, not go by what I think, not go by what my sister said, my brother said, my friends said, not go by what social media says. Stop looking at everybody who's taking pictures of themselves on a plane because it's really not a plane. Sometimes it's just a washing machine window that they see in right there. <laughs> You've seen it too. You know what I'm talking about. Don't get caught up with all that stuff. But what's the word of God saying? If I build my life on that, let the winds come, because they will come. Let the waves come, because they will come. Let the violence of the nature just take its course, because it will happen. But when the storms come, I'll still be standing, because my foundation is Jesus Christ. Come on, if you believe that today, put your hands together. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Father, today we commit ourselves to you today, Lord. We commit our hearts and our minds to you, Lord. We commit our lives to you afresh. While I'm grateful, Lord, that uh, 
I sense in my heart many were receiving what it is that you were communicated to all of us here today. My fear, Lord, is that we would just be hearers and not doers of this word. I pray, Lord, as we yield to you, that you, by your spirit, Lord, will convict us and then convince us of spending time in your word. Because when we spend time in your word, it is your word. And as we used to say in the 80s, your word is bond. Your word is unbreakable. You're not a man that you should lie, nor the son of man that you should change your mind. That means whatever you say in your word that you will do, you will do. There are principles and precepts that are in your word that no matter what, it's, it's relevant for all. Like things like where you said, given, it shall be given back to you, pressed down, shaking together, running over. That's not just talking about money. It's not even talking about money, the context there. But it's how we view people and how we treat people. But the principle is there. How we give is how we receive. That's why even those who don't know you, the principle still applies. They're philanthropists, people who just give. And you know what? You keep them ca- having what it is that they have because you won't violate your word. So if you t- stick to your word, even with those who don't know you, how much more will your word keep those of us who do know you? So I pray for all of us today, Lord, that we would stop building our houses, our lives on self, sand. When those, war- when those waters come, that house quickly falls. But your word says that it would be a great crash. No, Lord, we want to build our lives on Christ Jesus, the rock, the firm foundation. As the songwriter once wrote, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. No altar call needed, Lord, because Lord, in our seats where I stand, that is the altar right now, because all of us are responding to this today. Help us by your spirit so that when life deals us the blows that life deals us, because we're not exempt, that we'll be able to stand because we're in him. In Jesus' name we pray. Let us all say amen. Amen. Can we just thank God for his sustaining power? Amen. God bless you. Hope to see you Tuesday night for prayer. If not, see you next Sunday, the Lord willing. God bless you. Have a great week. Enjoy the heat.